and thank you for joining us today. I'm Olivia Rios, Director of Operations and Programs at the Alley Latino Chamber. And our speakers today are from BBSI, a PDO company who locally supports and provides solutions for payroll, HR, workers' compensation, and health benefits. Today's speakers are Heather Arcos and Frank Lopez, both human resource capital managers and account managers. Both have over 25 years of experience in the areas of HR and payroll. As you know, having a business in California has its challenges. As a state that has a GDP that rivals many countries, many have challenges keeping their doors open. Each year, labor laws are updated. Most have impacting trickling effects to small businesses who have challenges in adapting to them. As we know, the minimum wage increased and with the host of new laws imposed, not all businesses are in tune to the latest. There's really a lot of new laws to remember and that's why it's important educating employers on California laws. Today, Heather and Frank will discuss the risk of hiring, new wage compliances, and will share best practices to minimize risk and prevent costly errors. They will also discuss the AB 2751 bill and its implication on employers. You may write your questions on the chat box and those will be addressed at the end where we will also have an interactive session. Heather and Frank, we welcome you to today's program. The floor is yours. Great, thank you so much. Um, that was a great introduction. My name is Heather Arcos. And I'm really happy to be here to present on labor law and the employment risks. And I'm gonna turn it over to my co-host Frank and we'll get started. Hi, really great to be here. Good morning, everyone. We're very happy here to be able to share some critical information that can have a lot of consequence to your business. Without further ado, we will get started. So first of all, the presentation today is intended as information of value add to you. It's very hard for us to speak specifically about a particular case. These are simply best practices. We're not attorneys here. What we usually uh, recommend to our clients is to seek out both support from your HR consultant if you have one. And if you don't, hey, why don't you look at services with BBSI or legal guidance, guidance with uh, private counsel. And so our focus today is gonna be on the main areas of employment risk that we see in the wage and hour sector, uh, things like minimum wage, exempt versus non-exempt, meal and rest period violations. Um, a lot of employers get hit in these various areas. So we wanna talk about what those look like and what the best practices are to keep yourself out of trouble. So these are some of the daunting figures here. When we talk about wage and hour, wage and hour is one of the most common prolific penalties that your business will face. As you can see from the numbers and figures here, from 2020 to 2022, the numbers have incremented, right? They've gone higher and higher. The cost outline here showed the top 10 wage and hour lawsuits in these years. However, what we're seeing in the last two years, 23 and this year, is projected record, not only in uh, in volume of cases, but also in settlement amounts. And we mentioned this probably without saying that because these lawsuits can be devastating to a company. So it's important that we focus on how to prevent these types of claims from bring, being brought against your company. Some of you might be familiar with California's Private Attorneys General Act, PAGA. These claims have increased over the last several years and are separate, separate, let me repeat, from class action lawsuits. And so together they can be filed separately. Just an emphasis on that. One key difference to a class action is the attorney filing the PAGA claim can only go back one year but they can usually try to stack up the penalties. And to give you perspective, one labor code violation, if you have 20 employees paid weekly, could be a demand of over $200,000. And again, that's just one violation. 
Now, if California legislation and laws and regulation was not enough at the federal level, in 2023, there were over 400 Fair Labor Act, Fair Labor Standards Act class action suits that settled for almost half a billion combined. So that's about just over a million per case, million dollars to settle each case. Uh, the largest case in 2023 at the federal level was for $65 million. Meanwhile, if we bring it back to California, lawsuits filed under PAGA in California, as I mentioned, re have reached a high. 2023, there was 7.7K compared to la the year before 2022, which was only 5.8K. So as you can see, the cases are just rolling in. Now, there is a sigh of relief, two things. This November, you will see on your ballot a measure to repeal PAGA. It's called the Fair Play and Employer Accountability Act. So look out for it. There's a lot of special interest in favor of keeping PAGA, and there's a lot of money there from attorneys to keep it into place, but it will be on the ballot. The second sigh of relief is that you are here, and these are risks that can be significantly mitigated with the right controls and processes and procedures. So minimum wage goes without saying. A lot of people think, you know, yes, every year we go up and we look at our hourly employees and we increase them. But the biggest area that we see missed is salary exempt employees. Um, in California, it needs to be two times minimum wage, um, the salary threshold. So a lot of times um, employers will not look at their salary exempt employees and that will go unnoticed for a year or two years before an employee usually brings it forward saying, I think you're underpaying me. And then you either need to convert them to hourly or go back and try to pay them to, to meet minimum wage thresholds. So it's not something that you want to get into. So I would suggest if you haven't looked at your salary employees, just to take a look at them and make sure that they are aligned with the 66560 in California um, that was effective January 1st. And then additionally, we have specific city and county minimum wage rates. Uh, San Diego, Los Angeles, San Francisco all have these. So if you're in one of those areas, you'll wanna make sure that you're also complying with those. And those usually don't increase January. Those are usually a July effective date. And so you'll be seeing those upcoming uh, if you haven't already seen um, the new increases to those areas. This year, we also saw fast food minimum wage added. That was effective for one. So there are sometimes industry specific minimum wages that you have to keep in mind as well. And you just want to make sure that you're looking also if you have tool minimum wage. So tool, tool minimum wage is if employees are bringing their own tools to work. So if you're in an industry where tools are required, uh, construction workers, mechanics, technicians, things like that, then uh, you want to either be providing them the necessary tools or paying them double minimum wage for bringing their own tools to work. Most employers prefer to start providing hand tools, even if they're less expensive and things that the employee may not want to use, just to have them available for anybody that can't afford their own tools. And then they have the option to bring in their own tools. You still have the responsibility to ensure that everything's safe and OSHA compliant. And I recommend that you always document that they're bringing their own tools and that they understand that um, they may be inspected by you and things like that, but it will avoid the two times minimum wage in that instance. So this is an area that we see a lot of oversight with clients that come on to BBSI. And it's the idea of regular rate of pay. So what is regular rate of pay? So base pay is the ba is the basic amount that you introduce to the employee with your offer letter. Frank, we're hiring you, we're gonna pay you $20 an hour. That's my base pay. But it also might state that does not include, Frank, uh, commissions, nor does it include non-discretionary bonuses. So what does that mean? That means if I'm being paid commission and discretion non-discretionary bonuses, Emphasis on non-discretionary, and that's a whole separate topic. That means my regular rate of pay is a combination of my base pay, and it's an average of my base pay, my commissions, and my non-discretionary bonuses. 
And my sick time, my overtime, my rest and meal period premiums need to be paid at a regular rate of pay. One more time, folks. Regular rate of pay is used when you are issuing multiple pay rates, right? Frank, we're going to pay you $20 when you do this job. We're going to pay you $25 when you do this job. When you issue commissions, Frank, we're going to pay your base pay plus commission. When there's non-discretionary bonuses. And Heather, why don't you tell us a little bit about what's the difference between non-discretionary and discretionary bonuses so folks can understand. Yeah, so when you're paying a discretionary bonus, this means that this is not an expected payment. This is something that maybe at the end of the year, you just have a little extra cash flow and you want to share that with your employees. Whereas non-discretionary means that it's it's expected. The employee thinks that this is part of their compensation package. You maybe pay this out quarterly based on certain metrics, things like that, where the employee is anticipating that they're going to receive this if they do X, Y, and Z. And if that's the case, then that is a non-discretionary bonus and considered part of their compensation package and not just a gift or a, you know, end of the year bonus. Now, end of the year bonuses can be tricky because sometimes employers will say they're discretionary because if they don't make the money, they may not pay it out. But the employee's been receiving it every year since they've been employed for 10 years. Then it starts to become an expected payment and it can blur the line between discretionary and non-discretionary at that point. All right. So if you're getting paid base rate or if you're paying your employee a base rate and an, and they includes non-discretionary bonuses, make sure you incorporate that into the math when you pay out their sick and when you pay their overtime. The other piece is some clients have piecework compensation, right? I get paid extra per each widget. Well, you have to incorporate that amount into the base rate. To, cre to create the regular rate. And then finally, there's some clients that do service charges. This is very common in hospitality. So if you're if an employee is getting paid their base plus some sort of service charge, that needs to be incorporated, all right? So regular rate of pay, please do not overlook that piece. Again, if you have questions, reach out to your human capital consultant, reach out to your legal counsel, this is very, very critical, and it's an area where a lot of companies get, pardon my French, screwed pretty bad. So we're talking about piece rate. This may not apply to all employers, but we wanted to touch on piece rate compensation as there is a few things to keep in mind if you are paying that way. Um, this went into effect in 2016, so most of what we're talking about is not new for employers that pay by the piece. But um, you'll see this a lot in transportation, factory workers, mechanics, uh, where they receive certain per load compensation and things like that. Um, you'll still want to make sure that you're tracking their hours because you want to meet certain minimum wage thresholds. You also need to calculate overtime and pay a separate rest and recovery period. So you're going to see three separate line items on an employee that gets paid by the piece. You're going to see their normal per load pay, you're going to see that they got maybe possibly overtime, rest and recovery, and non-productive time. So what that usually means is that um, they are maybe delivering a load and they're waiting, right? So they're waiting to receive something to take back. And so that part is not really their transportation piece where they're getting paid per the load. So you're going to be paying the minimum wage or some other value while they're sitting there and waiting. Classification of your employees. The misclassification of employees is another area that's extremely risky and extremely cost, costly to employers. Now, one of the things we need to understand is the different exemption statuses, right? We have a professional exemption status, which is very uh, pretty clear. Uh, usually it includes uh, doctors, lawyers. There's really no debate in that area and very little risk. Then there's the executive exemption status and your executives are high level uh, employees in your organization that are in, at the chief levels of your organization, autonomous, making executive decisions, et cetera. It's the administrative exemption. 
where we get into problems. And that's because a lot of clients think that a position in marketing, accounting, possibly uh, bookkeeping, uh, leads, store clerks could be exempt status. And of course, if in, in case anybody's, um, to be clear, exempt means your salary, right? That means you're not paid for your time, you're paid for the results and the work that you actually create. So typically what we do is there an ex there's an exemption uh, analysis that we do with our clients. And we want to make sure the law says 51% of their roles and responsibilities need to class be classified as non-exempt for them to be salary, 51%. But for us, we're really trying to get our clients out of harm's way. So we go as far as 60, 70%. So when we do our analysis, we we position it so that, hey, client, 60%, 70% is non-exempt for this role. So you're pretty safe giving them a salary. Now, you want to make sure you understand what the risks are, right? Because there's some, some clients like to play on the wild side. If an employee is misclassified, meaning they should be hourly, and you have them as salary, a potential claim against you will mean that for three to four years back, you will have to pay them overtime, you will have to pay meal break penalties. So, and those will stack up. And this is an area where I've seen clients get hit. So just make sure that when you're classifying your employees, you're doing it properly. Now, some, I'll go as far with some clients and say, look, if we're unsure, if they're just like on the line at the 50%, 51%, pay them hourly because there's no harm and you pay them hourly and really they should be salary. Now, you could do a cost analysis as well and your HR uh, consultant can help you in that too. So you can incorporate multiple sort of approaches to this, but just know that it's a very risky area if you misclassify someone at salary and they really should be hourly. And in that vein, we wanted to talk a little bit about exempt employees and paying them and things that come up that you should keep in mind when paying an exempt employee. You're going to want to make sure you're paying for the full work week. So a lot of times I'll see employers say, yeah, but they didn't come in. Um, they don't have any sick time, but they didn't they didn't come to work for two days and we, we don't want to pay them for all five days. So in those kind of cases, you don't want to be docking their pay. Now, if there is a bona fide sick plan and or a vacation policy that they are receiving compensation under, you'll dock their salary and you'll pay them under that policy. So they'll still be whole for that work week. But these are usually in instances where they have no other time available and you're either docking their pay for full day absences um, or jury duty. Maybe they went out for a day for jury duty um, unless they are off for a full work week. You wouldn't want to be docking them for jury duty and as a form of discipline. So sometimes I'll see employers say, I'm gonna suspend them for three days. No, you'll wanna suspend them for the full work week so that you can dock that full work week. Um, you won't wanna be making deductions for like quality or quantity of work, things like that, that you would be doing with maybe an hourly employee. Those aren't things that you would wanna be doing with salary employees. So here's another area of employee misclassification. And that's the misclassification of an employee and or, or versus an independent contractor. Now, a few years ago, you probably remember a, AB5. I'm sorry, a, yeah, AB5, Assembly Bill 5, which basically established the ABC rules, which, which helped employers kind of delineate between what is an employee and what is an independent contract, right? And if you look at the graphic on the screen, it gives you a nice outline, but I'm gonna read to you the three outlines for a, the ABC test, right? A stands for freedom from employer's control during performance of work, right? If you're hiring someone to perform a task and there's really no need for you to supervise or have any sort of control over them, could be likely that they're an independent contractor. The other piece, part B, is work else is outside of the employer's usually usual course of business, right? So if you are a business management consult consultancy 
or you're a tax preparing company and you hire a contractor to build an office for you, right? That's clearly outside of the purview of what you typically do, right? That's the idea. So then it would be very clear for you to establish, yeah, this is an independent contractor because our our business does not even touch uh, construction. Now it can get it can get tricky. So on something like this, again, you want to resort to your human capital expert and or your legal counsel, part C, the person you're hiring, right? The entity you're hiring is customarily engaged in an independently established trade, occupation, or business. Sort of the key here is making sure you're contracting an entity like an LLC, an S Corp, a C Corp, right? A company versus just an individual, a sole proprietor. Because it, if it's a sole proprietor, it could get tricky. But again, what we always tell our clients is you have to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. And for that, you really need to consult with your human capital consultant or legal counsel. And the other thing is when you are putting these contracts together, if it is an independent contractor, do the due diligence, right? Get that contract reviewed by both your HR human capital consultant, and or your legal counsel, right? Just make sure that your contract is up to, up to snuff on this. So the payment of overtime and off-the-clock work are areas that we see claims filed. A lot of times if you get a claim and it has meal and rest periods and all kinds of other things, they throw in overtime and off-the-clock work. And a lot of times you'll see employers have not you uh, put in standby pay as um, or travel time as hours worked. Um, these are examples of where it might be off the clock work or impact overtime because maybe they worked over 40 that week or over eight in the day. Um, although there are provisions for overtime for the seventh day of work, the seventh day does have to be voluntary and they can't be forced to work the seventh day. So the only exemption for this is if the employee doesn't work more than 30 hours in a work week or six hours in any given day. But a lot of times the seven day work week um, is, is employees that are working 40 hours plus. So you'll just want to keep that in mind that if the employee refuses, that you shouldn't be taking action against them. The minimus time also has become a hot topic to consider um, off the clock work because Starbucks got hit with this. And it's things like pre and post shift work, security checkpoints. Uh, maybe the employee has to change into a uniform once they get on site. They're locking, unlocking, setting alarms or shutting down and, and turning on computers. Um, during uh, COVID, there was temperature checks and surveys that employers were doing in advance of them starting work. And these are all considered de minimis time. And for years, de minimis time was was just that. It just wasn't considered and we didn't put it on, on an employee timesheet. But now they're saying you need to be incorporating that. If you know that it takes 10 minutes to do all these tasks, you need to be adding the 10 minutes to the employee's time every day. And, and you know what? It can't be emphasized enough because the big court case was in 2018 when Starbucks got hit with a huge lawsuit for de minimis, right? And de minimis, the de minimis doctrine had been around since the 1940s. The U.S. Supreme Court basically said, hey, look, if the task is so diminutive, right, so small and insignificant, it doesn't have to be reasonably compensated because it would be a hardship for the employer to try to record that time. So we're not gonna pay for it. So for many decades, it, it was just, it was outside of the radar. But then in 2018, the California Supreme Court said, uh-uh, hold it, hold it. There's this one guy that's suing. He's spending four to 10 additional minutes, you know, off the clock right before he gets to work or right after he clocks in or before he clocks in, he's doing work. It amounts to four to 10 minutes over 17 months it adds up to over $100 in unpaid wages, right? And then you start multiplying that times however many employees Starbucks has, and then you start getting hit with penalties, and then you start getting hit with legal fees, it amounted to millions of dollars. Now, that was in 2018. You would think that employers, especially these large employers who have the capital to hire attorneys and human capital management consultants would learn, but in June of this year, Home Depot just settled for unpaid, for alleged, right? Because they settled 
alleged unpaid uh, wages for $72.5 million, right? So you cannot emphasize enough how even if the big boys, right, the big boys and girls of the world in corporate America are not protected, we who are small to mid-sized and emergent really need to protect ourselves. And specifically, let's look at meal and rest periods. Right. California law says that an employee is required to take at least 30 minutes for every five hours they work and another 30 minutes for every 10 hours they work. Now, there's some caveats there. For instance, someone can uh, fill out a waiver through consent, their own mutual, you know, their own consent and has to be mutual with the employer where they can say, look, I'm going to skip my lunch, but I'm not going to work more than six hours. Or I'm going to skip my lunch, but I'm not going to work more than 12 hours. All right. So these waivers are, are, are permitted. And these waivers, one of the recommendations is to renew them periodically, either quarterly, monthly. I mean, it's almost like the more often you do it, you're probably better off. I know it's a lot of administrative burden, but as long as there's a sequence and a, and a consistency to it, that's really important. Now, you want to make sure that you're following the guidelines for meal meal and rest periods, right? Because again, it's one of those areas that even the big boys and girls of the world in corporate America can't hit. So like we mentioned earlier, there's a lot we can do as an employer to mitigate and just have best practices where we follow uh, appropriate meal and rest periods. So on-call or standby pay is a question that comes up a lot. There are some industries that this applies to more often, like plumbing companies and things like that, where they have workers that stand by because they're a 24-hour operation and they may need to be available to go in, but may not actually be doing a job for a portion of their day. These hours are still able to be paid at a lower rate than the employee's standard rate, so maybe minimum wage. It would count as factoring in overtime and double time because they are considered hours work. So these are all factors that you want to consider when you're looking at whether that time is compensable. Because if you have an alternative, like they don't have to come in, but maybe if they're available, they can or they can push it off to the owner or another employee then that wouldn't be necessarily considered on call because they have the option not to answer the phone. They have the option to say, no, nope, busy with family, can't go in. Uh, somebody else is going to have to deal with that. So it's really looking at your individual situation and seeing if on-call pay actually applies. Time rounding, right? Time rounding should be done, actually should not be done. And because it's always, and it always should be done if it is done in favor of the employee, but overall our recommendation to keep you out of court. And as you can see in 22, Home Depot got hit with another lawsuit, right? When they found that the employer was rounding. And, and again, if the bigger corporations are not getting with the program, what's to say we're impervious as small, mid-sized and emergent businesses. Again, Overall, the recommendation, the conservative recommendation is don't round on your clock. And if you have a timekeeping system, there's different uh, controls in place that you can implement. Um, ask your timekeeping administrator on how to, how to best set it up. But again, do not round. Rounding is something that recently, as of 22, Home Depot was hit. And then again, they were hit just this year. Now, travel time, many employers in many different industries have situations where travel time may apply. Where I see a lot of confusion is um, employer provided transportation to the job site. So that's actually an example of where travel time should apply. And if you're providing an employee, say a van to travel to work, and that's the only form of transportation that they're able to use to get to work, then travel time would apply. Whereas if the employee is using their own car, the normal commute between home and work is not considered travel time. And if employer transportation can be provided, but it's not required, then you wouldn't pay. So a lot of uh, organizations decided to not let the employees take their vans home and instead have them travel into a location where the vans are held, pick up the van at that point. That way they're not paying that commute time to get to a job site. Payment of wages. 
So one of the things you have to make sure you're keenly aware of is on your pay stub, if your pay stub does not meet the required criteria according to California law, you could be penalized for it. For instance, in California, we're required to have uh, for our employees sick time. That sick time should be reflected from day one. Now, I've had clients say, hey, Frank, I have a 90-day pro waiting provision on the sick time use. Kind of want to keep it out of the paycheck or the pay stub because then it draws a lot of questions and I don't want to have to deal with that or I want my people to deal with that. Unfortunately, the answer is you have to have it from day one. Failure to do so can lead to, remember PAGA, one violation multiplied by however many employees multiplied by how many times uh, whatever the pay frequency is, it really can add up. So make sure you consult again with your human capital management expert or your legal counsel to make sure you audit your pay stubs to ensure that it includes the necessary categories to avoid any sort of claims against you. Now, final tips in California can get somewhat confusing. When to pay, how to pay it, when it's supposed to be paid, can I direct deposit it, um, what are the penalties and fines for paying late? Along with the timing, uh, issuing those checks, there are rules around it. So if you're actually terminating an employee on site immediately, you're going to want to make sure that that check is available. If the employee quits without notice, you have 72 hours from that time frame to get them their check. If they give at least 72 hours notice, you still have to have that check available for them at the time when their last day is. So along with the timing, you want to keep in mind, you also don't want to be mailing out checks without the employee's authorization. You may have an incorrect address, then it gets all convoluted about, I didn't get my check on time, things like that. So you just want to get maybe even a text message just saying, yes, please mail my check. This is my address. Um, and as long as you get that check post dated by that 72 hours, you're good there. Um, you don't usually want to direct deposit a final check because a lot of times you can't get a, a direct deposit done within the time frame that you need to, or they'll get the direct deposit before you've communicated to them that you're terminating them. So a lot of times you're doing these checks in-house, um, physical checks where you're actually handing it to them or mailing it if they're if they're agreeing to that. Reimbursements. So reimbursements are really common, but I feel like it, the question of what should be reimbursed, a new a new level to that conversation came up when COVID happened, right? Now people are working remote from home. So the question is, what am I supposed to reimburse them from, for? And what am I not you know, required to reimburse them? So as you can see on the slide, there's a list of items that are reimbursable expenses. And really they're just costs incurred by an employee for any business related activity, right? That's sort of the key. Now, one of the things I've had asked uh, by clients is like, Frank, I, I, I give one day to my employees to work remote. Like, what do I need to reimburse? Well, is that day mandated or, or is it just like a, you can take it if you want. If you're not mandating them working from home, those expenses at home are, are really not subject to a reimbursement. Now, if you were forced to, like when we had COVID or you, it was part of the description in the job that this was a remote position. Then we're talking about reimbursable expenses, right? Expenses that the employee is making to conduct business for your company that should be paid, you know, reimbursed to them. Now, the question I also get from clients often is, Frank, what is, what is the amount that I'm supposed to reimburse? Well, unfortunately, the law is not very clear. And maybe in the future, it will clear up with some case law. But it really just says you have to be reasonable. As an example, if your employees are using their mobile devices to conduct business, and this is their own personal mobile devices, you're not providing a device for them, then the question is, well, how much do I reimburse them? What is reasonable? I've seen clients reimburse them anywhere from $20 to you know, $20 to up to, up to 100% of whatever their bill is. 
Now, the law just says you have to be reasonable. So in determining whether you're being reasonable or not, consider how much are they using that device for work, right? If they're constantly being called, if they're using data services because they're having to log into their mobile device to use some of your um, business applications, emails, et cetera, consider usage when you consider how much you reimburse. But the law is really not clear. And one of the things with a lot of these things we've talked about is make sure you have a policy in place that elaborates and makes very clear what that reimbursement uh, process is, what that reimbursement policy is. So we wanted to touch a little bit on the proposed bill AB 2751. It's the right to disconnect and how it may impact your business. So what the proposal is, is it gives the employee the right to ignore most employer communications outside their normal work hours. If passed, this bill is going to be the first of its kind in the U.S., although many other countries have already had these types of laws in place. It's proposed because the boundary between professional obligations and personal life is somewhat blurred in some companies. And so the expectation for workers to be available around the clock without appropriate compensation is what they're trying to combat, essentially. So they say, you know, it's important for uninterrupted family time free from work-related interruptions, right? So um, there's been uh, concerns raised about the potential ramifications on workplace flexibility, and it is slated for discussion in the upcoming weeks since it hasn't been passed yet. Um, the limitations already on how and when employers can communicate with non-exempt employees are, are there because they have to be paid if you are contacting them outside normal work hours. However, this could pose challenges for exempt salary employees because they haven't really defined it as only being applicable to your hourly workforce. So this may end up being applicable to salary employees, and most employers are used to being able to communicate with their salary employees without having to worry about any ramifications. Um, so you would have to establish traditional business hours for these type of positions where you're not contacting them outside of these these work hours, which could pose a challenge for many industries. So the pattern of violations is what they're gonna look at when they're talking about fines. So it'd be three or more documented instances of communication outside of work where the employee could then go and file a claim. There's no concrete steps that need to be taken for compliance yet as the bill hasn't passed, but there are some opportunities to look into uh, practices and prepare for the possibility that where this may pass in the near future outlining um, a right to disconnect policy and, you know, just making sure that you're defining when it's like emergency situations, urgent schedule needs, what your workday would look like if you had to impose something like this. Um, emergency under this particular bill is defined as the unexpected event that disrupts or shuts down operations. So if you have to communicate that they don't need to come into work because the plant shut down or there's some act of God that happened that where they can't come in, that would be really the only time that you would have the ability to connect with them. Not if you just need to ask them a question about a client or, you know, even these like one or two minute conversations just wouldn't be permissible under this. proposal. Right. And with, with all that said, we usually enjoy taking questions from, from our clients, from folks that have joined our webinar, because we know that, Maybe something came up and wasn't clear. There's clarification needed. For instance, one of them is, Frank, regular rate, regular rate of pay. How do you calculate that? Well, we actually have a separate training that we do with our clients on how to do the calculation. And uh, we will also audit them right, if they need it. But let's open it up to questions. I can't see the chat on my end. Let me see if I can open it up. Any questions in the chat? I got one here from okay, it's just D. D, yeah, rent reimbursement for home space. That's a tricky one. I feel like case law needs to go into that because just in the same way that an employer, right, if you have own your own business and you have a dedicated space in your office, you can dedicate the square footage of that space. This is one that I have not come across and that there's very little guidance on. So that's a very good question. I think what we'll have to do is we'll have to wait in the coming years to see what the court says. Um, but the answer would be right now, and Heather, please correct me, that I wouldn't, I wouldn't address it. 
I would just address, I mean, because they're going to have a home, they need a home, but I would address their internet use, right? If they're 100% remote, um, if they had a, usually you want to supply them with a laptop, but if they don't, possibly reimbursing them for a laptop. Some type of reasonable allowance for having yes. to utilize their own space. Yeah. And you know what? Within the reasonable allowance, you might be able to make a case that it covers rent if the issue ever comes up. But yeah, the, the courts have not said anything. I've not seen anything on that topic. That's a really good question, though, D. We have another one here for mm -hmm. exempt salary. All employers have to pay 64480 a year to exempt employees. Big hit for an emerging business. Yes. So it's so well, basically six, six, uh, six, 66,560 is the number. Okay. Uh, it's two yeah. times minimum wage. Yeah. And so next year it'll go up. Yeah. Every year it'll go up. Yeah. Some of my clients that are smaller don't have any salary employees because it just doesn't make sense for them. Yeah. So they want to pay, you know, a lower hourly rate and have them work 40 hours a week as opposed to having them be salary because the threshold is so high because yeah. these salary exempt positions to be classified as exempt, um, that salary rate is reasonable because mm -hmm. it's for it's really supposed to be for executives people in higher up positions that have hiring and firing authority mm -hmm. um so these are people that you're probably paying 60 plus thousand dollars to anyways mm -hmm. um so if you're paying under 66 560 chances are they're probably not doing duties that would align with them being salary exempt anyways and so they may be misclassified so it's just better to pay them their $20 an hour or whatever it is and um, not have them work overtime and just have them come in as an hourly worker. That that makes sense. Thank you. Um, I do have a question. Um, so can I know you gave examples of the. Um, what was it? I know you gave examples of, you know, like Home Depot being penalized for not for doing X, right? What about small businesses? What should a small business look out for so they're not penalized? Yeah, so I mean, Home Depot and, and Starbucks are very large organizations that got hit for millions of dollars, but mm -hmm. the same type of lawsuits can come to small businesses. Like I've seen businesses of 10 employees or less get hit with class actions or PAGA lawsuits that talk about all the same things, meal and rest periods, like the attorney's approach is the same, whether it's small or midsize or large. Mm -hmm. So really the, it's the same approach, you know, as long as you put things in place where you're not, you're paying the right minimum wage, you're, you're paying meal and rest period violations, you're doing all these things, then you're not going to open yourself up to risk to be hit. It can bankrupt an organization that gets hit with something of that substance because the penalties are the same regardless of size. Yeah. And I would, I would add, so prevention, right? Prevention, Heather hit on a few of them. One of the things is one of the, 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 the things that BBSI offers, right? It's a professional employer organization. What does that mean? That means they provide a, a, a set of different services from human capital management, risk management, right? Risk and safety, payroll, uh, business strategy, partnering up. And it's not a good fit for everybody, right? PO is not for everybody, but it, if it is a good fit, it's a great investment. And because a, a, a professional employer organization can help you with all this, your policies and procedures, your timekeeping. If you offer benefits and you want to be more competitive benefits, workers' compensation at a wholesale price because it's with the PEO, the benefits, the medical benefits are composite rates, right? Because uh, it's with the PEO, so that usually they're cheaper than in the open market. Um, so partnering, believe it or not, I always encourage, because a small employer, mid-sized employer, emerging employer wants to focus on their craft. You don't have to want to worry so much about, you know, Bob's going to sue me, Skippy's going to you know, put me in a situation where I might go bankrupt, partner with the right folks, right? There is a ROI. So I always recommend timekeeping systems, policies, procedures, um, having a, a, a third or second person involved, like an HR consultant, legal counsel, a risk and safety manager. And maybe you can't hire those people, but that's where a partnership with the PO might make sense. 
because you're hiring a team of professionals, highly skilled professionals that you can go to and you can run these questions. They can help you set things up properly. So the prevention piece is really, really key. So one last question, and I know you uh, mentioned timekeeping mechanisms, but when you're a small business, you have three, four, maybe five employees, there's going to be that trust factor where, mm. you know, you don't have a time clock, but mm -hmm. you hope that your staff or your employees are mindful of their hours and you go on the, you know, they, they literally just put their time on a sheet or on a report. So mm -hmm. is there any other um, recommendations that you can give to employers for keeping accurate time to avoid being sued? Yeah, so timesheets for me are are tough because a lot of times employees will write eight to five, eight to four, you know, and a lawyer will get a hold of that and say, yeah, I know the employee signed it, but there's no way that every day they work these exact times, right? So that's why even smaller businesses getting a very, you know, cheap, inexpensive way to track actual time, either where they're clocking in on their phone or something like that. Uh, I had a client that bought a program through Amazon, for example. Um, so there, there are a lot of cheap options out there, even if you're not going to go with a big software company or like a PEO space like us, where we have our own timekeeping system. Mm -hmm. um, there are options out there to track time. If you are going to do a sheet, um, you would still want, you know, a block of information at the bottom where they're certifying each time that the times are true and correct, that they received all their mail and rest periods, you're giving them a space on there where they're writing in any discrepancies mm -hmm. so that you, if you're challenged, can go and say, I have all the records. I paid exactly what they told me that they work. They signed each time. Um, I didn't just make up these times. And, you know, that will help you in that litigation. Okay. So what can you recommend for someone who's like eight to five and um, what would be the ideal scenario to not get sued? Well, I'm I'm a little partial on this one, right? Because you do need solutions, right? You need a set of solutions, mm -hmm. a concerted solution. And obviously we can look at this next slide deck piece and you can see solutions. But outside of this, we've had we've had clients say, you guys are so much more than just a regular PO, for instance. Clients will come to us because they need access to capital. Some of us have connections within the banking industry. Uh, I have one client, hey, Frank, I want to buy the business off of my dad. Well, how about we get the business valuated? So we're getting them, getting them a free business valuation. Uh, clients will say, hey, Frank, you know, all sorts of things, including us being a therapist, right, to our clients. So mm -hmm. I, I, I've been in the PO industry now for six years, and I do believe it's, it's a great investment for employers to mitigate and hedge against risk, but it's also a great investment, right? To get more at productivity out of your employees. Because if you if you set up the right culture by working closely with your 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 business consultant and your HR consultant, mm -hmm. you can get a lot more done. And then you can focus more on what your business does versus all this other distractions, right? That can be very risky, very costly. So uh you know that that's my part of my partiality. Heather, I don't know if you want to add anything else. Yeah, I mean, because even outside the PEO space, the tools that are available are are so robust and like and affordable in a lot of cases that even companies that can't afford to go with, you know, a large company like us or ADP or or any of those types of solutions, they will still get something because when you're challenged, they're looking at you like, okay, so you're gonna pay you know, $600,000 for this case instead of spending $50 a month on a timekeeping system, you know, like, so the, the cost of investment is really there, I think, in those kind of things. Okay. This is really, really okay. great information. Do you have any um, last minute golden nuggets to share with our attendees? Well, let's see. If you have any questions, we are also members of the Los Angeles Latino Chamber. So we are at some of the events. Our contact info is on the screen. Um, you cannot emphasize enough the importance of just making sure that you follow California law, right? And I, my clients often complain as, you know, as it's understandable. We live in California, highly regulated environment. 
but at the end of the day, you are the master of that universe, that employment universe that your employees live and thrive in, right? Mm -hmm. That operate in. So you can set up policies, procedures, you can set up, uh, you can train your managers to do things right. You can have timekeeping systems. I've seen small businesses and I always like to call them emerging businesses, right? Because I don't want our business owners to think small. I've seen them operate at a smaller capacity, but emerging capacity where they have everything under control and everything's clean and everything's set up tight and they're profitable, right? So it's very possible to get things done right. You just need the right team. You need the right training. You need the right policies. And that's one of the reasons why companies like BBSI exists to help you get it right. Yeah. There's one last question in here. Yeah. In general, what is the cost for a PEO? Yeah. So that's a very good question. It will depend on your employee size, um, whether you're going to include benefits into your package. And the benefits question is really, are you looking to acquire more talent? Are you looking to keep your current talent and stay competitive in the market? So it would just depend if you're interested in a no obligation quote, our information is up there. So reach out to us. We can we can put together a quote for you so you can get a sense of what a PEO um, because it's tough because we have clients with five employees. We have clients with over 200 employees. So, yeah, and, you know, and that could be a great testimony that, you yeah. know, we use BBSI for our payroll. It makes it really easy to use the, the platform that is provided to us. If mm -hmm. I have any questions, I have two ladies who on call, if I just eat, shoot mm -hmm. them an email, they will respond rather quickly. And mm -hmm. if they don't know, they will find out an answer. You know, yeah. when it comes to reporting capabilities, when we applied for a couple of grants, we're able to just, you know, get assistance, provide the report that's needed. And they're really, really helpful. So, you know, we are a fan of of BBSI and we can't say much more than that, but, you know, we appreciate the assistance I do. Cause you know, I, yeah. I, I handle a lot of um, yeah. uh, responsibility here at the, at the chamber and, you know, thank you. Yeah. And well, you know what? Thank, thank you, Olivia, because I always tell my clients, your ROI is really a reflection of how much you engage with us and how much you partner with us. Mm -hmm. If you're a partner that doesn't reach out to us, cause we'll check in with our clients, but if you are not reciprocating, you're not going to get the same value or service, right? So yeah, thank you, like, Olivia, for like having our own HR department. Yeah, uh, in the other building that's not you know not adjacent to my office, but yeah, they're really resourceful and helpful. Yeah, yeah. So you basically are getting an HR team, right? That you would have to pay them like eighty thousand dollars a year potentially, right, for the skills mm -hmm. and services they provide. Mm -hmm. But you're not paying eighty thousand dollars a year, and you get all these other services: payroll, workers' mm -hmm. comp, etc. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I want to thank you and Heather for today's session. And I know yes. um, I'll be, hopefully you'll be joining us at the expo in July. So um, yeah, so we will be there. Okay. Thank you. So the LA Latino chamber will be hosting a business expo July 24th at the Sheraton Fair Plus conference center in Pomona. As you can see from the slide that's up, those are a partial list of our sponsors we will have about a thousand folks in attendance. Do sign up. We have sponsored attendee uh, registration. So uh, come on out to see what you can learn. There'll be valuable resources for you to scale your business. On that note, we appreciate your time this morning and thank you.